The universe is a big place. Our observable universe, literally everything in existence that we can observe from Earth, makes up only about 5% of our universe as a whole. There's a whole lot out there that we don't understand, even here in our own solar system, and even here on our own planet. So let's focus on something we should understand, something more trivial. Rain is the lifeblood of the Earth. It feeds our rivers, fuels our ecosystems, and floods Florida homes. But yeah, rain is everywhere. But how much do we actually know about it? Well, we all know the water cycle, at least we should. But what about something even simpler than that? Do we even know what rain looks like? Apparently not. We asked a couple people to draw us raindrops, and strangely enough, almost everyone was wrong. These drawings have something in common. Each one is teardrop shaped, having a wide globular form at the bottom and tapering to a point at the top. But wait, why aren't raindrops actually this shape? To figure this out, let's talk science. Air resistance is a force that counteracts the force of gravity on falling objects as they fall through, well, air. This is the equation. It looks scary, but all you need to know is that it increases with things like shape, drag coefficient, and cross-sectional area. And it is also dependent on speed. Basically, the higher the speed, the higher the air resistance. And while raindrops are small, they're fast, at least for their size. The top speed of a raindrop is around 10 meters per second. For reference, Usain Bolt's first record 100 meter sprint was around 10.4 meters per second. That's faster than the average speed of traffic in New York City. If this is the case, shouldn't raindrops simply take the most aerodynamic shape? According to the Smithsonian, the most aerodynamic shape is actually the teardrop. This is due to the Bernoulli principle, which states that slow-moving air has higher pressure than fast-moving air. Fast-moving, low-pressure air sticks to the teardrop shape, smoothly gliding over instead of creating low-pressure vortexes that cause drag. The teardrop shape would allow the raindrops to move with the least air resistance, but air resistance isn't the only force that acts on water. Water is polar, which basically means its molecules can form weak electrostatic bonds with each other, aka cohesion, water's love of sticking to itself. Cohesion is responsible for surface tension, which means that the droplets form a sphere. However, as they fall, the bottom of the raindrop flattens out, while the top remains spherical due to the air pressure between the top and bottom of the raindrop, forming an almost hamburger bun-like shape. Some even balloon into the shape of an umbrella or a jellyfish. They will never adopt that familiar teardrop shape. So where did the familiar raindrop shape even come from? Though the specific time and inspiration remains unknown, conventional wisdom tends to agree that it comes from the shape of dripping water. Because of water's polarity, there are also forces of adhesion, or water's love of sticking to other stuff. Water dripping off of a faucet or a leaf is dragged up by adhesion to form the signature teardrop shape. Now with that myth dispelled, I can continue to fish in this flooded Florida home. Maybe watch the weather and... You see that? What's that? Well, what's with that raindrop? Why is a reputable source servicing thousands, if not millions of people, using raindrops shaped like teardrops? We just went over this! You, you gotta level with me here, because we clearly established that this is a myth. To figure that out, let's first look at this image. You probably feel something looking at it. Perhaps an emotional response or a memory of some sort. Maybe you think of danger, both fictional and very real. Despite all this, this image, the biohazard symbol, is essentially meaningless. It's not based on any real object or phenomenon, and that's exactly the point. The biohazard symbol, when it was designed in 1966, was made in order to be recognizable and stick in one's memory, but also have no meaning associated with it. It means absolutely nothing, but we as a society have given it so much meaning. The study of assigning things meaning is called semiotics. Properly defined, it is the philosophical theory of signs and symbols. In the field of semiotics, the most basic form of communication is through signs, which are defined as anything that can be used to communicate. Inside the field of signs, there are several subsets, including symbolic signs and icons, among others. Icons are where the sign clearly resembles the signified. 
Symbolic signs, on the other hand, are a subset of signs, which is where the relationship between the signified and the signifier is purely conventional and assigned by culture. As we explained earlier, the biohazard is a symbolic sign. Other signs, such as the flame hazard sign, is an icon, as it clearly resembles a fire. Some signs change their subset over time, such as the floppy disk symbol used on most programs to indicate saving. Floppy disks themselves have been obsolete for over 20 years, while the abstraction, the symbol, has remained. The floppy disk has embedded itself into our culture, developing a meaning of its own despite the original device's extinction. To many, that icon only means save, its history is irrelevant. Many of these visual anachronisms persist into the modern world. The phone receiver has survived as the symbol for the phone app, even when landlines have long been replaced by mobile phones. The icon for email is still a traditional paper envelope. Other signs have their original meanings that contradict what they are used for today. For example, in the US, the caduceus is widely associated with medicine. However, it is the staff of Hermes, which is used by printers in order to represent themselves as messengers of the printed word. An army officer saw it in a medical textbook and mistook it for a medical symbol. This incorrect adoption stuck around, but it does not diminish the communicative nature of that symbol. Yes, we were. And we really still are. This matters because we are surrounded by symbols. All around us, symbols and signs stand as reflections of us. As reflections of our culture and not just in what we see. Our language, our words, are in essence just symbols. The meanings of our words aren't concrete and can even convey different messages in different contexts. They're meaningless abstractions, groups of random squiggly lines that come to develop meaning, develop power, because of us. It can be argued that the relationship between humans and symbols goes more than skin deep. Philosopher and rationalist Noam Chomsky believes that all humans possess a language acquisition device, or an innate internal mechanism for learning language. While Chomsky's theory has not been scientifically proven yet, it's easy to see why it might be true. If humans are actually inherently designed to create connections between the arbitrary and the meaningful, it would make sense why we rely so much on our symbols and words, and why they are so ingrained into ideology, our culture, and our humanity. So sure, this image is wrong, but can't the same be said for this image? Neither actually resembles an actual raindrop, but their meanings are both purely conventional. We understand them both, they effectively convey the same message, just as so many other symbols convey theirs. So, yeah, raindrops aren't actually raindrops, but that's okay. 